Welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be talking about random variables, which is a, a new way of us thinking about experiments and defining the outcomes for our experiments. Um, so here, when I talk about a random variable, I'm talking about something which will give us a number to assign to each outcome of an experiment. Uh, so when I say a random variable, there's two parts to that. The variable part is talking about how there are different values that this variable might take on. It might take on different values depending on what the outcomes are. And the random part is that this variable takes on different values according to chance, that this is tied into some sort of an experiment where probability is involved. Now, typically, we'll be using a random variable when there's an experiment where something is being counted or measured. So that's kind of a, a natural choice of when you might want to throw in a random variable. So example might be we flip a coin three times and then X counts the number of flips, which are heads. And so then X can either be zero or one or two or three. Or we could think about selecting a tree in Goldstream Park and Y measures the height of the tree in centimeters. So this would be something maybe where we imagine that Y is some sort of number, maybe between zero and let's say 600, that we might have a tree in Goldstream Park anywhere between zero meters and six meters tall. And when I say any number in between, I'm including decimals and fractions and all the rest. Um, so when we're talking about random variables, you can see that there's a couple of different kinds. We have the kind like X, where there's a finite number of different outcomes. And then there's the kind like Y, where there's infinitely many different outcomes. One thing just as far as notation goes, notice just like for events, Typically, we use a, a capital letter when we're defining a random variable. So here I've defined my random variables as X and as Y. Now, we can also include random variables even for experiments where the outcomes aren't numerical, and that can be done in a totally arbitrary way. So, for example, there's a, an experiment where I select a student and ask them, have you taken Math 100? And for that, the outcomes for the experiment are either yes or no. But I can include a random variable if I just say how numbers will be attached to those outcomes. I could say, well, I'll define a random variable A, and if the person says yes, then the random variable takes on a value of 1, and if they say no, then my random variable takes on a value of 0. The choice of numbers here, 0 and 1, those are completely arbitrary. I could have just as easily said A will take on a value of a million if they say yes, and negative 12 if they say no. Um, and again, another one here, asking people their favorite kind of cheese, and they could say cheddar or Swiss or brie or something else, and depending on what they say, the random variable C will take on the value 1 if they say cheddar, two if they say Swiss cheese, three if they say brie, and four if they say anything else. So as we can see, whether we're talking about experiments where the outcomes are uh, numbers by nature, or whether we're talking about experiments where the outcomes are not numerical, in all those cases we can always define a random variable if we want. One of the advantages, one just to mention this before we get further into this, about defining a random variable is that essentially you're defining multiple different events simultaneously. If you were thinking about this experiment where we're counting the number of flips that are heads, if you were interested in the event that one flip was heads, you would have to define the event let A be the event that one flip is heads. And then if you were interested next in maybe the event that two flips were heads, you'd need to define another event. Let B be the event that two flips are heads. And so on. But for this, any event that we're interested in terms of numbers of heads can be expressed in terms of values of X. So if you were interested in the probability of getting one head, that would be the probability that X is one. If you were interested in the probability of getting somewhere between 
1 and 2 heads, then you're looking at the probability that x is between 1 and 2. And you could rephrase anything that we're interested in as far as numbers of heads that you might flip or size of the tree in Goldstream Park. You can express those in terms of probabilities of x's or probabilities of y's. So the kinds of different experiments that we're looking at, I said you've got kinds of random variables like x, where that's a finite number of outcomes, 0, 1, 2, or 3, and that's it, as opposed to y, the height of a tree in centimeters, which is some real number in an interval of real numbers. It's an infinite uh, infinite number of possibilities as to what y could be. Again, because we're not expecting that number of centimeters is going to be a whole number necessarily. We're measuring the size of this tree in centimeters and that means we could potentially have decimals. That's why we've got infinitely many values for y. Uh, not a surprise here, this is finite mathematics, not infinite mathematics. So we are only going to be looking at the case where the random variable has a finite number of values. If we have a random variable x, then we can define the probability distribution for that random variable x as this function, lowercase p of x. Some books might write it as lowercase f of x. It's really the same thing. It doesn't matter what name we give to this function. But what this function does is it gives us the probability of x being whatever value for all the possible values of x. Now, you can express those probabilities in a bunch of different ways. If you're remembering back to chapter 4, we created probability distribution tables. So we had a, a table where we had all of our different outcomes and then below that we had their probabilities. And we could do the same thing with a random variable. Instead of listing our outcomes with words, we'd be listing the values that the random variable can take on, and then below it list its probabilities. We can also have, and we'll see this in 5.2, our probability function p of x actually being an equation expressed in terms of x. In other words, we will eventually get to the point where we'll have a probability function where all we need to do is put in the value of x and it will give us the probability of x being that value. Now if you're creating a probability distribution and if you've got a probability distribution lowercase p of x, you need a couple of things to be true. Number one, p of x has to be between 0 and 1. In other words, it needs to be something that's probabilities. Remember, probabilities are not negative. They're never larger than 1. And the other thing that we would need, same as before, is that all of our probabilities together must add up to 1, because, of course, in your probability distribution, that should contain all the possible outcomes in your sample space. And you know that the probability of your entire sample space should be 1, so the sum of all the probabilities for all the possible values of x should also be 1. And so we can use that here to fill in this probability distribution table. I've got a random variable y, and it can take on these four values, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And one thing to note is that we know the probabilities of x being, of y being 1, 3, and 4. The probability of y being 1 is 0.2. For y being 3, it's 0.1. For y being 4, it's 0.1. The one thing we don't know is what's the probability that y is 2. But we do know that all of these need to add up to 1. So if you're thinking about what the value is that should go in this spot, it should be 1 minus all of the probabilities that we've already put in. In other words, you should expect that what should be inside of the probability for y being 2 should be 1 minus 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and the other 0.1, which turns out to be 0 0.6. So if the probability that y, of is, uh, that y is 2 is 0 0.6, then we would have all of these probabilities adding up to 1, and this would be a valid probability distribution.
So there we go. We've solved our first problem, which is what is P of 2? And it is 0.6. The probability that Y is 2 is 0 0.6. And now for the next part, if we want the probability that Y is 3 or less, that's the probability of Y being 3 or 2 or 1. So we would just need to find the probability that Y is 1, 2, or 3 all added together. And going through our table, 0.2 plus 0.6 plus 0.1, that adds up to 0 0.9. I know we don't need to use this here, but I mean, good to mention it just now for future reference. If you were looking for y to be 3 or less, you could have just as easily said, well, I'll look at 1 minus the complement. The opposite of being 3 or less, in this case, would be being 4. The only possible values for y are, zero, uh, are 1, 2, 3, or 4, so the opposite of being 3, 2, or 1 would be for y to be 4. And notice that you would get the same answer of a probability of 0 0.9 either way, whether we're doing things directly or whether we're using the complement. Next, we want to know what value of Q is going to make this into a valid probability distribution. And I'm going to use again the same idea that we did before, which is that all of these probabilities should add up to 1. Number 1, they should all be valid probabilities. Number 2, they should all add up to 1. So let's start off with that fact, that everybody here... should add up to 1. And if I simplify what's on the left side, 1q plus 2q plus 3q plus 1 more q gives me 7q. I've got 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, that's 0.3. And I can then solve for what q needs to be. And I find that q is 0.1. Now that I've got that, if I wanted to, it didn't ask me to, but if I wanted to, I could now use that value of Q to find out what exactly are the probabilities of X being 0, 1, 2, or 3. So when X is 0 and Q is 0 0.1, then the probability that X is 0 would be 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1, which is 0 0.2. For x being 1, putting in 0.1 for q gives me 2 times 0.1 minus 0.1, which is 0 0.1. And then doing the same thing for x being 2, putting in 0 0.1 for q gives me 3 times 0.1 plus 0.1, which is 0 0.4. And then finally, putting in 0 0.1 in for Q here gives me 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, which is 0 0.3. And now notice that all of our probabilities that we have in our table, they are indeed valid probabilities. They're all numbers between 0 and 1. Nobody is negative. Nobody's larger than 1. Good for us. And these all together do add up to 1. 0.2 plus 0.1 plus 0.4 plus 0.3 all adds up to 1.